My colleague Shivarur continues to be live with us from close to the Gaza Strip. In fact, uh, Shiv, there was a lot of outrage yesterday when this uh, ground offensive was started and, you know, intensified in a way the assault that Israel has been carrying out against Hamas. There was a lot of outrage. We know of the UNGA vote as well, calling for an immediate ceasefire between Israel and Hamas and for that corridor to be created so that aid could reach uh, Gaza. I want to understand from you what is Israel's response because when you bomb or you conduct an airstrike and you say and you claim that, you know, hospitals uh, are where Hamas is hiding because they know that nobody would, con uh, you know, target a hospital. But if you do target establishments, there would be collateral damage. There would be innocent civilians who could be caught in the crossfire. What is Israel's response? You know, that's a very good question. I'll start by saying, uh, uh, Polomi, uh, systemically, domestically, politically, and otherwise, uh, Israel's disenchantment with the United Nations is probably at its lowest ebb right now. Uh, anything that the United Nations says right now is going straight out the window as far as Israel is concerned, uh, because they believe that the United Nations has an agenda to run and is focusing more on the humanitarian crisis, which is no doubt happening. And if you can uh, see in the distance, Polomi, one more airstrike in the distance somewhere probably near Gaza City has just taken place while we're talking uh, uh, as far as far as as far as the collateral damage is concerned now uh, Israel has always had a kind of protocol response to this uh, they they always say that a uh, we have a right to defend ourselves what happened on October the 7th is uh, you know like a second Holocaust it's the biggest attack that Israel has suffered uh, you know uh, since the post-war period uh, which is true in terms of numbers secondly they say that all all protocols have been uh, uh, you know carried out in terms of asking the people of Gaza and civilians to leave but it is that the Hamas that is using them as as uh, civilian uh, as human shields uh, you know conducting its operations in subterranean you know uh, cabins below hospitals like the Al Shifa uh, that it continues to uh, you know uh, operate and uh, position its rockets and other offensive systems from schools and hospitals and uh, you know residential neighborhoods and that it embeds itself in residential areas areas so as to uh, you know give give the aggressor pause uh, israel this time in terms of uh, you know the care it is uh, you know it professes to take to differentiate between uh, you know neighborhoods that may have uh, civilians and cause collateral damage i think the appetite for that is uh, is quantifiably less as a result of the scale of what happened on october the 7th uh, uh, you know, that may be difficult to digest for many. It is difficult reporting it from here. I can tell you that, Polomi. But it also goes down to the fact that uh, Israel is right now fighting not just militarily on many fronts, but also politically, geopolitically, ideologically on many fronts. It has pressure from many groups. Uh, it, it is still coming to terms with the fact that its biggest ally, the United States, uh, you know, uh, while it has deployed big in the Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean, is not, you know, is not... F unambiguously in solidarity with it because it is parallelly uh, cautioning Israel and asking it not to conduct this large-scale uh, ground operation. And therefore, uh, the, you know, the element of collateral damage has, has been a constant. It has been a constant throughout the Israel-Palestine conflict. You see it in every single cycle of violence uh, in this conflict. And this time, however, I think the point goes to show that Israel says, look, you know, we've been bled more badly than we've ever been bled before. This is the worst thing that the Jewish state has suffered since the Holocaust. So please don't mind us as we continue to try and defend ourselves. Uh, obviously, that doesn't mean they're saying, uh, you know, we don't care about civilians. But those civilian casualties, as you and I have seen, Polomi, in the, in the reports that are coming out from Gaza, are very, very real. Claim versus counterclaim can continue to happen over numbers, but a humanitarian disaster is undoubtedly unfolding in Gaza behind me. And it's only set to get worse as the deployments, the intensity of the operations increase. So that's what Israel's stand really is right now. They don't feel like they owe an explanation to anyone at this point of time. Okay. Shiv, um, also uh, just uh, taking from that... Uh, as far as that UNGA vote was concerned, India, of course, abstained as far as that vote was concerned because our position was there was no mention of uh, the October 7 attack. There was no mention of Hamas and hence we did not sign on the dotted line as far as that resolution was concerned. Given the background of India's foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the Israel-Palestine conflict, how we've always stood for a two-state solution, etc. How do you see the position we took yesterday? 
I, I think, uh, you know, I, I, two, two different things, and I'll, I, and I'll t talk about both of them because it's a good question. And, and believe me, even among international journalists here, it's become a pretty big talking point. Uh, Polami, first, let's talk about the, uh, uh, about the UN General Assembly uh, vote. Uh, the, the Security Council vote, the, the fact, uh, the GA uh, vote, the, the fact is that India has taken a principled position as far as Hamas terrorism is concerned. That was borne out by Prime Minister Modi's statement, which was one of the first by a world leader, unambiguously uh, condemning it as an act of terror and expressing solidarity with Israel. In keeping with that, a Jordan-sponsored resolution calling for a humanitarian pause that does not mention that the trigger for this entire crisis was a terrorist attack, uh, you know, was, was seen to be simply untenable as far as India is, is concerned and inconsistent with Indian foreign policy itself. So that's the reason it uh, it went through. But remember that even while India abstained, it did uphold the words about, you know, calling for a peaceful resolution and a cessation of hostilities. Those are very important phrases that most critics of India stand in the UN to abstain, uh, uh, you know, conveniently miss out. Now let's come to India's policy as far as uh, uh, this is concerned. India's policy on Ukraine last year was also heavily criticized. You know how that turned out. India's policy as far as Israel and Palestine has always been nuanced. It's always been nuanced, even though recent, uh, you know, recent developments have been colored by a marked proximity between India and Israel. Uh, India right. very, very firmly, very, very acutely distinguishes between relations and terrorism. And that, I think, shapes that foreign policy. Mm -hmm. It supports a two-state solution. It supports a mutually sustainable two-state solution and peace between Israel and Palestine. But that does not mean it will not condemn terror. And as you saw earlier today, Polomian, as you reported, Israel is now hoping that India bans the Hamas as well.